Today we're going to make an animated fire trail using Blender, and it's going to look like this. Guys, welcome to CG Cowboy, I'm Dale Forbes, and today we're going to create an animated fire trail just like you saw in the logo, and we're going to add sparks to the fire, we're going to add additional flickering firelight to enhance the lighting effect from the fire, and we're even going to add floating ash and dust to the scene for realism. Now I'm going to have links to each of these sections in the comments, so you can jump right to the ones that you want to see and skip the ones that you don't. Here we go. Now I'm starting with an existing scene. Uh, I've got my plank in here, uh, which I'm using for the, the intro uh, animation. And all I have is a camera, I don't have the default cube, and I don't have any light source at the moment. So if you're starting from an existing scene or a, um, a, a brand new scene, it doesn't really matter. The approach is still the same, at least that, that I'm going to recommend. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into top view mode, and I'm actually going to start with a curve. Now one reason I like to use a curve is because it helps me shape the fire flow or the fire emitter that I'm going to use. Now in my case I'm going to use a circle because I'm going for more of a ring of fire. Now if you're going more of a linear type of fire trail then maybe you want to use a, a bezier so that you can shape that and then uh, the process is the same. So I'm going to hit Z to go into wireframe mode and I'm just going to try to line this up as best I can. I'm not going to get perfect for, for this tutorial but uh, I'm just going to line it up as best I can to where I really want the fire to to fall. Now this isn't perfect so I'm gonna go ahead and go into edit mode. I'm gonna hit A until all my segments are selected. I'm gonna hit W to subdivide it. I'm gonna do it one more time just to give me a little bit more control over the segments and move them to where they should go. So I'm just hitting G to move each one of these segments along the ring and I'm not going to get crazy about that for now, so let's just go with that. Now we're going to convert this into a mesh because that's what's required to, to have a flame flow from. But um, before we do, I want to make a couple of quick changes to this to give it some surface area. One of them is to change the fill type to full. Probably not totally necessary, but uh, just the way I like to work. And then the other one is to, to give it some bevel depth. In this case, I went with 0.007, but just keep in mind that the larger you make this, then the more surface area you're getting, you're giving your flame, and then the bigger the flame is going to be off of that surface area. And I went up just a little bit on the resolution, and that's pretty good right there. So I'm going to hit 7 on the numpad, make sure everything's still lined up, and then I'm ready to go ahead and convert this into, into a mesh. So I'm going to hit Alt-C, convert to mesh from curve, now if I go into edit mode with tab and I hit A to select all the vertices, then you can see it creates a, a mesh, first of all, but it also creates the vertices pretty close together. So it evenly distributes the geometry. And that's really a, a big part of this because we're going to build this, right? We're going to animate the build. And I want to make sure that as it animates, it's got a pretty even build uh, rather than having it um, have some segments build uh, in small segments and some in large. If I would have started from a mesh, then what would happen is these would be smaller over here, and they are. They're smaller than these over here. But as I scaled it along the x-axis, these would have been larger segments, and I would have had to worry about subdividing them. So starting with a curve and then having Blender convert that to a mesh gives me a pretty uh, even distribution of the segments themselves or I should say vertices uh, now that it's a mesh. So I'm going to go ahead and tab back into object mode. And now I'm ready to go ahead and animate the, the build itself. So in order to do that, there, there are a couple different things that you have to do. One of them is I'm going to go into edit mode. And um, well, first, let's add the build modifier. That might help. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and rename this to fire ring. And go ahead and add the build modifier. And when I do that, then I'm going to right mouse click, drag here, and you can see the way it builds. Now in my case, that's not really the, the build order that I need, the default that, that Blender gave me. I want this to build from left to right. So in order to do that, I need to change the sort order for the faces within the mesh. But first, let's isolate the fire ring on layer 2 so that we can work on that without seeing the, the rim of the plank uh, underneath us. Now I'm on layer 2 where my fire ring is. 
And just for workability, I like to see just the visible layers in the, the outline. That way it's only showing me the, the objects that are actually in the layer that I'm, that I'm working with. So I'm gonna drag this along. I see how it's building, but really I need to change the sort element. So two things I need to do in order to make that happen. I'm gonna go into edit mode, and the first thing I need to do is to go into face select mode. The build modifier works on faces. And if you don't do that, it's not going to work, and it's pretty frustrating trying to figure out why you can't change the sort order here. I'm just going to hit N to close the Properties panel and T to close the Tools panel and give us a little bit more room. I went, first of all, with 100 frames uh, in my final animation. If you want this to be quicker, then you know, make it something less than that. I'm going to change my, my end frame here so we don't have to wait forever for it to loop. Um, and you can see that you know, it's going to build, well, i got to go into object mode first, uh, have it build, go back to the beginning, builds more quickly. Let's see, I even lower this even more so, goes very quickly, or I can slow it down and have it build uh, over a larger length. But in my case, I stuck with 100. So now that I've I've figured out that, uh, and if I go into uh, edit mode with tab, I'm still in face select mode, I can go into mesh, sort elements. Then I've got a lot of different options here, but the, the one that, that I used here was view x axis. Now that's because um, my view is top view, and I want it to build along the x axis. So I'll go ahead and do that now. And it's important to understand that this is from the view. Now I'm going to go back in object mode and I'm going to hit it and you see that's exactly what I'm going for. But let me do this again just to, just to show you. I'm going to change my view. So I'm going to go at a bit of an angle here. And then I'm going to go into edit mode. I'm still in face select mode. I'm going to do the exact same option. Sort elements, view x axis. Tab back in object mode and let's see it again. I'm going to go back in object to, to top view. And you can see it's not quite aligned right so you've got this bottom segment or this bottom half actually ending up over here and that's because the view is important so for me to have this build evenly across the the top and the bottom then I need to make sure that my view is on the top and back in edit mode sort elements along the x-axis. The other one that can be useful is the cursor. So if I hit right click, by the way, I use left mouse button to select. So I'm moving my cursor with the right mouse button. So that's why I right click. I'll move my 3D cursor over here. I'll do a sort elements from cursor distance. Now it takes that cursor location and chooses how to build the mesh so now it's building from the cursor location all right so we won't cover the other options there in my case this is pretty simple I'm gonna go ahead and sort the elements from the view along the x-axis and I'm good to go now that I have that working the way I want it I'm gonna make a couple of copies here I'm gonna to go to the end of the timeline just so I can see the whole thing built I'm gonna make I'm gonna sh do shift D I'm gonna make one copy and call that fire sparks. That is going to be our sparks emitter for adding sparks to the fire later on. I'm actually going to grab that along the Z axis and move it up over my fire emitter. And then I'm going to make another copy of that one. And I'm going to move that one to layer three. Go with the layer three. It's still selected. And I'm going to name that fire light and that's because we're going to use that one to help uh, add more light to the surface area now the fire itself is going to add light but uh, in my case it wasn't quite enough in your case maybe you don't need this fire light but I needed a little bit more light uh, in order to to really get the illumination that I wanted on the, the plank now that we have those created let's go back onto layer 2 so I'm hitting 2 on my keyboard uh, select the window first to my keyboard and now I have both the the fire ring I also have the fire sparks which is going to emit our sparks later on but I'm going to go ahead and hide the the fire sparks uh, with H and we can bring that with alt H later on 
uh, so that I can work on the fire. So in this case, I'm just going to use the quick effects and do a quick smoke and it automatically creates our domain adds the settings also for the the ring itself to be a fire emitter now the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna just raise the top of the domain because we're gonna have a little bit of smoke I'm not gonna make it very dense but I don't want it to accumulate and then kinda of get in the way as I as I look down at the fire from the top so if you want to change the domain I recommend changing it in edit mode so I'm gonna go into edit mode and I'm already in face select mode so I'm just gonna grab the top and then raise it along the z-axis uh, a little bit so let's go and check the settings for the fire flow in this case so I'm over here in the simulations tab and uh, or simulations panel I guess and it is the flow which is which is correct of course but the flow type is smoke now we want fire and even though we're not selecting fire and smoke we will get smoke so just fire and in my case I went with a pretty large flame rate now you may have to adjust this down and again you'll remember I said depending on the the size of the mesh uh, that's going to control uh, how much surface area is going to control the size of your flame this is a pretty small surface area so I'm going to raise the flame rate uh, a bit with four and that may even be too much but I know if my final um, product my final animation uh, four is actually what I went with. At this point, I'm ready to go ahead and check the animation. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. I'm going to hit Alt A, and I can see I'm getting the the fire animation uh, that I want. Now, obviously, this is really low resolution, so a couple things are happening. The fire is is really really tall, so it's actually hitting the top of the domain. Uh, you can go ahead and raise the domain even further if you want, if that's happening to you. But I'm going to go ahead and pause it here for a second. You also see that uh, it's really broad around the base. Now, if we look at the domain settings, the default uh, for the fire is 32 divisions in the resolution, and this is low res fire, which is which is fine for now. We're going to change that. So, what happens when we change the the final resolution? In my case, it was it was 96, but things tighten up, so the flame isn't quite as high it comes in a little bit and things tighten up around the base so don't get too hung up on whether it's too wide right now you'll get a better idea once you bake it uh, at a higher resolution now if we go ahead and do a quick render of this I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that's selected I see almost nothing because of the material which of course only includes smoke by default and I just hit shift F3 in order to change this window to the to the node editor now everybody has their own little flavor of what a, a good fire material looks like I actually copied someone else's and went with this which I got off of stack exchange from Bither uh, who I guess is a little bit mysterious uh, actually allows you to download it uh, from stack exchange of course you can pause the video to copy this down but I'll also put a link to Bither's uh, blend file so that you can download that and pull the material right into your blender file the only thing I changed was the smoke density so instead of a value of 4 in the multiplier uh, I actually went with a 0.5 since I want uh, less dense smoke and more focus on the fire I'm gonna go ahead and change my world settings to all the way black which is what I used uh, for the final animation here and let's go ahead and change the settings um, the way I change my domain settings I'm just gonna give you a snapshot here and then I'll I'll fast forward and, and uh, change them in this particular scene so let me walk through it real quick the resolution my final resolution was 96 it's very tempting to go higher than 96 but uh, personally I don't think you're gonna see a great deal of additional quality uh, by going higher than 96 uh, velocity I was I was fine with the default of two if you want a little bit more erratic fire then uh, this is where you would uh, help influence that uh, I did the adaptive smoke domain which is helps me in the in the final performance uh, in the high resolution settings I did bump the divisions up to two uh, use the noise method of wavelet which is default with the strength of four again a little bit more for an erratic uh, smoke look uh, did change when I'm ready to bake here change the end uh, to 150 for me of course this depends on how long your your actual animation how long your scene is going to be and then a couple of uh, effectors um, uh, field weights that I had to change the reason I'm changing these these weights uh, here is because I'm going to put force fields in to control other things 
like dust and ash, uh, sparks maybe, and I don't want those fields to affect the the fire. So that's why I want to make sure that these are zero so that they don't affect the fire So and I can still put them in the scene to affect the other particle systems. Let's bake this. Now that it's baked, we can see that the fire is much more defined. Um, it's tightened up, uh, certainly all over, including around the base. So this is good for me, uh, and I'm going to stick with, with this. Now, I'm going to move on now to adding more things like sparks, like dust and ash, just to add some realism for my particular scene. Uh, you may not do that for yours. If you don't, and you're going to stop here, let me just tell you now that as the flames build into your scene, the more flames that you have in your scene, so in my case, the ring grows, there's more fire, that uh, your scene is going to take longer for each frame to render. Now, in my case, it took about 25 minutes on average for each frame to render, and you can imagine 150 frames, that was days. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you don't have to do a thousand samples like I did, uh, which will certainly reduce your render times, but it's still you're still in for the long haul. There's just no right way around it. Now let's move on to the light. So the light you'll remember I put on layer three. So I still just have, I'm hitting Alt A to start the animation. I still have the same animation I had before, but this is gonna serve as my light. Now I'm going to bring in all three layers. So I'm going to, I'm on layer three. So I'm going to hit shift two, shift one, and now I've brought in all three layers here. Now I can't really see what's going on here. So the flame is actually a little big for me. So in this case, if, if your flame is a little bit too large for what you're looking for, again, you go to the emitter. This is my fire emitter. And in this case, I'm actually going to bring the flame rate down to about two. And I'll show you what that looks like so you can just see the difference uh, as I rebake here. So I'll reselect the domain and then free this bake and start the bake process over again. So that's a little bit better, but um, I could probably even afford to, to lower it a little bit more. So, But now you can see at least the difference between um, those two settings on the flame rate. So now let's start working on the light. So I'm gonna hit layer one. I'm gonna hit shift or hold shift and hit layer three where I know the, the light ring is, as I'm calling it for lack of a better term. So now that I've changed the layers that I'm looking at in my hierarchy here because I'm only seeing the visible layers, it's easy for me to select um, what I wanna work with. So in this case, the fire light, which I have no material for and I just really need a simple emission material but I'm gonna play some games here just to make it simulate the the fire light and the uh, erraticness <laughs> erraticness if that's a if that's an actual word uh, of the uh, of the light effect so I've got a simple emission material here but I'm gonna walk through this in a second uh, first thing I'm gonna do is actually raise the light ring up a little bit off the surface and then I'm gonna stretch it a little bit I'm gonna scale it along this z-axis and that's going to give me a little bit more effect from the light and also give me um, some room to, to mess with the texture. So I'm using a noise texture here, which I'm going to control with the color ramp in a second, and then this math node with the multiplier value selected to control the strength of the, um, the emission material here using a simple orange. A lot of different shades of this would, would probably work just fine. But in this case, uh, something that's going to, to match the, the fire light color, I guess, if you will. So if I do a render mode here real quick, then it's not much going on here until I start to tighten these up. Let me bring in the black and the white values just to tighten up the, the, the noise texture itself. Now you can see it start to take on... Um, you know, where some areas are lit, some areas are not. And the idea here is that I'm gonna animate this in order to try to simulate the, the fire uh, flickering uh, on the surface of the plank. Now it's gonna, not gonna match perfectly, right? I'm not gonna see, well, this part of the emission is going to be highlighted while this is a higher flame and this is a lower flame over here. That's not gonna happen, but hopefully it's not something that, that can be noticed by the human eye anyway. Now I kept the noise texture pretty close to, to what it is here by default. Oops, 
what I do there. 5.5 .5 is what I kind of went with. But really the setting uh, games come down to the, the texture mapping. So I made this zero in the, the Z scale, and that gave me a pretty good effect here. And then it was a matter of uh, playing with the scale on the X and Y axis um, just to get something that was fairly evenly spread. I didn't want too big of a dark um, opening, a, a dark gap, or, or even a light gap in some cases uh, to make it look a little bit too uh, uneven. This is actually pretty good. So really all I did was just kind of play around with these until I got something that was, was relatively usable. I think, uh, I think we're pretty good right there. But it's the animation of this that's really going to sell this effect. And in my case, I started, let's give ourselves a little timeline here. So I'm going to create a timeline. So I'm going to go back to the first frame, hover my mouse over the location, and hit I to put a keyframe over the location. This will give us the starting point of our animation. And then I'm going to go to the last frame of 150, which is actually going to be my final. So let's go ahead and change our range to 150 and then change the Z value to 10 and put another keyframe on it I and then I won't be able to see it much here so really the only way to really test this effectively uh, is to go ahead and uh, see it's building here so obviously there's nothing over to the right here to test this effectively is going to go ahead and render out at low resolution some uh, frames so animate the frames now don't do this with the fire because you'll wait forever but it won't take that long to go ahead and render out a few frames even if you decide to do all 150 frames uh, just to see uh, the light effect that's coming from your uh, animated uh, fire light so to do that just keep these uh, layers selected one and three go into your uh, output settings so in this case I'm going to go ahead and select the directory to output here, go into my ring of fire folder, which is where I save my project. I'm going to create another folder and I'm just going to say light test, go into that folder and select it for my output. And then from one to 150 in my frames, I'm going to go ahead and, and click animation to render out all those frames. But before I do, I really don't need a lot of samples here. So I'm going to bring this down to, let's say, about 10 samples, which is plenty. And then I can go ahead and render out those frames just to get a good idea of what my light effect is going to look like. So now that I've finished the test, even though I didn't have my camera set up at a really good place, um, what I can do is I can take my frames. Now what I like to do actually is use something called DJV view in order to, to test my, my animations. So using that tool, uh, pull the frame, the first frame in there, and it actually pulls all the frames in. Uh, so I gotta change this to 24 frames per second, because that's what I actually rendered it at, and then I can go ahead and play this, and you see what I'm talking about. So pretty, uh, pretty flickery, I guess, uh, which does a pretty decent job. Um, uh, this is exactly the, the type of approach that I used in my final title animation. So I'm going to go ahead and, and stick with that. But of course for the real test in intensity, I need to go ahead and make sure that I've selected the fire and oh, I shift selected layer one, shift select layer two. Now I have them all. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get out of the render view mode since everything really slows down with that fire in there and then for me the view from the top was really what was important so I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at that um, and render just a few samples of that now and from a light intensity perspective I can see that actually works pretty well I'm gonna go to go ahead and go with that but it did help me see that I forgot a step and that is when I render the the light ring I see the actual light here I don't want that I want it to illuminate the surface of the plank but I don't want to actually see the light so in order for me to fix that I need to go make sure I select the light I'm gonna to go to layer 3 which is where I know my light is select my firelight go into the cycle settings and turn off 
camera visibility. Now I won't actually see the light itself, the ring, but I will have still the illumination effect that I'm going for. I'm pretty content with the light ring now, so I'm going to go ahead and start working on the sparks. Now you may remember that I actually hid the, the spark ring so that I could work on the fire itself. So I'm going to hit Alt-H, which is going to bring everything back that I've hidden. Uh, that just happened to be the only thing. And I'm going to select it up here in the hierarchy. And I'm going to go ahead and hit the slash key on the numpad so that everything is hidden except for my spark ring. And this, again, is just going to be the emitter for the sparks which if I hit slash again, it brings everything back and you can see is slightly above my fire emitter, which is where I want it to be. So in this case, I'm going to create a particle object first, which is going to be a simple icosphere. And we're going to go with one subdivision on the icosphere and then we're just going to move it out of the way over here so we don't see the original. Then we're going to go to the ring itself and we're going to create a particle system on that ring. So for this particular project, I just want to show you the settings that I made without actually walking through and, and changing them all. So I, this, uh, this was about 200 particles that it, it required. I didn't start the particles right away. So I had the particles start at frame 40 and then continue on through the end of the animation with some randomness in, in the lifetime, uh, but otherwise kept the default of 50. I did use the modifier stack, of course, because I'm using the, the build modifier. And also started with an initial velocity. I swear every single time that I do something like this, the settings change a little bit. In this case, I needed a little bit more uh, velocity on the positive Z axis. So it's actually started out with a pretty high uh, value of, of four here just to get them moving up, even though my gravity was way down to, to about 0.1. So uh, I did name the uh, object over here Spark. So that was the object that I chose, of course, to, to uh, render in the particle system and made it very small 0 0.01 and about halfway through on the random size to get some randomness in the size of of the sparks themselves and now that i have those settings in there you can kind of see it might be tough in this recording let me bump up the size just just so you can see the action on these so you can see the um obviously i've exaggerated the size here but you can see the at least initial uh animation of the the sparks, including the velocity, uh, et cetera. But what's really going to control the motion of the sparks is when we put in the, the forces next. By the way, I did forget the emitter should be checked off uh, so that the spark ring is not actually rendered in the final animation. So I'm going to bring these back down to the normal size since that looks pretty good so far. So let's go ahead and give the sparks a uh, material. So I'm going to hit uh, the slash again to bring everything back. And there we go. Now I have my spark object over here and let's give it a new material. So I fast forwarded to, to the node setup here. And what I've done is put in a particle info node, which you'll find in the input particle info. And then this is kind of a universal uh, setup for sparks and controlling the color based on velocity. So we take the velocity and we do a dot product. This is a, a vector math node. So under converter, we've got a vector math here using a dot product. And you can look this up on, on Blender Stack Exchange, but this is about calculating the velocity of the vectors uh, of the sparks themselves, dividing it by itself and coming up with a velocity and then a color based on that velocity. So if we take the value from that calculation and we multiply that, in this case, 0.1 seems to be a common setting. And so we change this to a multiply, and then that will give us a color based on the velocity. Uh, so a higher velocity would be on the lighter side, darker would be on the orange side, and then that feeds into the color of the emission. And then in my case, I used a strength of two, which seemed to work pretty well. So that's the setup there. Um, I highly recommend, unless you figured out a better way, this, from what I can tell, seems like uh, the formula that everybody seems to be using. And now that we have the color down, now it's time to change the, the actual motion of the sparks. So this is where I want to put in a force field of smoke flow. I'm going to move that up just to take a look at it. It doesn't really matter where it is. And 
now I'm going to go ahead and change the settings of the smoke flow. And quite simply, it was a strength of five that worked for me and keeping a flow at one, which creates a little bit of drag on the sparks and, and makes it a little bit more realistic. That may be enough for you, but it, it wasn't for me. I actually needed a little bit more randomness to the sparks. This wasn't really it. And maybe it's because I had a, a Z velocity of four, if you remember in the particle settings, but I actually created another flow not a flow, but another force field of turbulence and put that in there. And in this case, uh, in those settings, I had a strength of 10. I had a noise size of five and that was it. And that gave me the look of the sparks uh, that I got in that final animation. Now you'll remember in the fire system, in the domain settings, you'll remember that I had down here uh, the effectiveness of the force field and turbulence to be zero. Now, if I hadn't have done that, then these effects that I'm trying to make on the spark, because they're in the same layer here as the, the fire domain, the fire would have been affected by those force fields and been erratic, which is why it was necessary to do this. Now, just so that you can see exactly what those settings gave me, let's take a look again at my final animation frames. And of course, I changed the position of my camera and animated that as well. But if you take a look at the sparks, they're kind of all over the place. So arguably, they're, they're, might, they're going a little bit too erratic. Now, you see in the beginning, they're going kind of from right to left, oh, lower right to, to upper left. Since the fire's animated, the smoke is, is kind of flowing back that way. Uh, since the fire is moving from from left to right now for me what really sold the as the sold the scene as the final touch uh, if I put, bring this over here again you can see kind of floating ash and dust uh, whatever you want to call it uh, I'm gonna call it a combination of both it's kind of floating around in the scene and that's really uh, what I'm gonna consider the the finishing touches at least for my particular scene so let's let's go ahead and walk through that To do that, I'm going to actually go to layer four and I'm going to create a cube. Uh, this is going to serve as our dust domain, if you will. I'm going to edit the cube, go up one, just because I like to scale the cube with the origin point at the bottom. And then I'm going to change the uh, maximum draw type to wire. We don't need to see the surface. And I'm going to shift and click on layer two because I want to make this about the same size as the smoke domain. So there I hit shift to Z as I'm scaling it so I can scale it just on the X and Y axis. And let's just go ahead and go with that. In fact, I can probably scale that down a little bit more. That's pretty good right there. Now I'm finished looking at layer two, so I'm just gonna go to layer four. And actually I'm gonna go to layer, the layer uh, 14 uh, right underneath it and this is just kind of how I like to work sometimes I'm going to put the particles down on this layer that way I know what where the particles are that are just uh, used for the layer above it so in this case you may have seen me do this before again but I use a plane just like that I use two different particle types and I'll go through this kind of quickly I'm going to apply the rotation and scale I'm going to add a array modifier and separate it a little bit. And it doesn't really matter how many here. I'm just going to go with about 12. All right. I'm going to go in edit mode and I'm going to do a two loop cuts there. I'm going to escape out of that. Go back in object mode. Then I'm going to add a displace modifier with noise or clouds, I guess, in this case, using a hard surface or hard noise type, I should say, and then a strength of two. And this just gives me some kind of erratic uh, displacement texture. In fact, I'm gonna create an empty. Let's move that forward. Actually, I moved it down, doesn't really matter. Well, let's move it up here. And I'm going to control the displacement based on that empty, which means I change this to an object and select my empty. 
And then that way, if I'm looking for some variation, not that it matters at that point, just move the empty around. I'm going to go ahead and take the dust particle, and I'm going to hit Control G, and I'm going to put it in a group called Dust. Now this is the, the node setup that I ended up going with for the dust particle and ash particle materials. Now this is a little different than the previous dust tutorial that I've done and I really like this combination of translucency and transparency in order to not only give that translucency of course to the, the dust and ash but also give me a little bit more variation in the shape using that transparency node. Now to do this I did have to alter with a vector mapping node the X scale just a little bit just to get this particular look because it looked a little bit too stretched without that. Of course the noise texture went a little bit larger uh, using a value of 3 on the size but really the what sold it to me was the the color ramp and bringing in the whites in order to um, make more of the particle transparent and give this particular look. So re really a good place to start uh, playing around with the, the look that you want here. Now that I have this object assigned to a group and I have a material assigned, now I'm ready to split this object into separate objects. So in order to do that, the first thing I have to do is to apply the array modifier. Then I'm going to go ahead and tab into edit mode, hit A until everything is selected, and then P and separate by loose parts. Now I tab back into object mode and now I can separate select each one of these as they are a separate object but now each one of them already has an assignment into the dust group and they're all assigned that material. I'm going to create one more particle type and we're going to make this uh, an icosphere. I'm going to leave the subdivision at 1. So we'll move that to the back. we we'll do the same thing by adding an array. Let's do we'll do about 10 of those. That works. Now after I apply that array, if I select the icosphere, shift select one of my other particles, hit control L, I'm going to link the material, do it again, link the modifiers, now you can see the displace was added to it, one more time, and link the group. Now this icosphere is in the same group of dust. So if I go over here, I can see it's in dust, has the same material, and now it has that displacement added to it. So the only thing I need to do now is go into edit mode, separate by loose parts, and I have all these individual objects that are now part of that group. And now when I go back to my cube for my dust particles, I'm going to go ahead and create a particle system. We're going to call this, we're going to create two particle systems actually. We're going to call this one dust small. Change it up here as well. In my case, for the small particles, I use 500. I emitted them through frame 90 because I wanted them to be all emitted by the time frame 90 comes up. But all of them have a lifetime for the full animation. Uh, we are covering the volume, uh, so that means fill the particles on the inside, not on the surface. I don't want any initial velocity, so bring the normal down to zero. We're going to emit the group called dust. We're not going to render the emitter. and. 0.05 was actually what I went with. In gravity, I actually want these moving very slightly upward, so I'm going to use a negative 0.1 on the gravity. And then I randomize the, the size. So if I go back, start playing the animation, you can kind of see them start to float up, and they actually look pretty good. Now depending on your scene these may be actually too large because I'm actually going to create another particle system that's slightly uh, larger than these. Let's, oh, sorry, let's add one here. Let's select dust small first. Call this one dust large. Now add one. <clears throat> 
dust large. And since we pulled in dust small and then added it, now everything is exactly the same as dust small. So we could just change the settings that we want. In this case, I want fewer particles in the larger dust. Everything else is the same except for size. In my case, 0.1 worked. So you can see kind of some larger dust particles there. So if I turn off the small particles, you can see at least at this frame, uh, those those may be too, too big. Not sure, but these are actually the, the ones that I used in, in my final animation. However, I don't want the dust just floating straight up like that. Whoop, hello. There we go. I don't want the dust just floating straight up like that, right? So in order to really make this look like dust that's being controlled by the erratic uh, air pressure of, of the, the fire, we're going to add a turbulence field in here. So field, turbulence. Again, I'm moving that up, but it doesn't really care. It doesn't really care. It doesn't really matter. And then for the settings, in this case, it was a strength of 8. Noise size of three, some drag on the, the pressure, so a flow of one, and that was it. So now if we see the effect, um, you can see kind of moving erratically. Now, we're talking about a pretty uh, big and erratic fire, so this might be okay, but if it's not, then you want to slow that down, then just slow the strength down you create more flow, increase the flow. So let's see what happens when we create additional drag from the flow. And this is the kind of effect you get. So really just depends on what kind of look you're going for. Now as far as testing this out, I recommend since the final render is going to take a long time, you really want to make sure you're, you're pretty comfortable with how the dust is going to look. So I would take a similar approach that we did with the light, and that is go ahead and select everything but the flames, right? So basically layers one, three, and four in this case, and render out the animation to um, another folder that, that you can see a test on. Now it's not gonna look uh, ideally, ideally, it's not gonna look exactly like it would with the fire. So in order to get a, a better idea of the lighting, I would go to the fire light and I would crank up temporarily, crank up the emissions. In my case, I cranked it up to about 50 just so I could see the dust a little bit better. So after doing that, I actually got, uh, I rendered out all 150 frames since it really doesn't take very long without the, uh, without the flames. So now I can see the, the light itself and hopefully you can see in the, the video here, but I've got the, the dust particles. Now in the middle of the plank here, they're, they're really hard to see, but I think once the, the fire's in there, and I can get a good idea over here of what the, the uh, motion of the, the ash and dust looks like. And uh, I kind of like it, so um, I'm going to go with uh, these settings. Now that all the pieces are done, let's let's put them together. So I'm going to go ahead and position. Uh, I want to do one good quality frame, so I can see everything together. I'm going to go ahead and let's come to a frame that looks pretty fully built. Let's go about let's go about there. Position my camera. Control Alt Zero on the numpad. Select my camera. Just going to move it around a little bit and pull back so I can see the flames. In fact, let's go ahead and put in shift select layer two. There we go. And let's just see, let's see how that looks. First, I'm gonna save it, control S. And let's do one, I'm gonna do about 200 samples, full resolution of just this one frame. Now that took about five and a half minutes at, at 200 samples and, and arguably I didn't even use denoising which I used in my final scene. I highly select, highly select, highly recommend you turn on denoising and I ended up using a thousand samples which took about 25 minutes per frame. Probably not that necessary but by rendering a single frame I can kind of tell uh, if I'm happy with the overall look. The quality of the fire is good, the lighting is good. But what's really hard to tell is the 
the ash and the dust. And that's why the animated uh, ash and dust without the flame in the, the portion before is, is pretty important because without the movement here, it's, it's really tough to see because it should be subtle. And so a single frame is, is kind of hard to see. You can see a little bit on the outside, but um, you really need that animated dust in order to tell whether you're really going to be happy with the scene. In this case, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. So I'm ready to render out all the rest of the frames. So I'm going to go and select uh, a folder just like I did the test before. I'm going to select a folder and just call it Final Frames. Accept that to, to render all my, make sure my uh, settings are the same, including motion blur. So we're using an icosphere for those sparks, right? But what we really want is we want those sparks to look more like these, these streaks. Uh, and that's done by turning on the motion blur so that the motion actually creates the streak out of the, the uh, velocity of the icosphere. So make sure you're comfortable with the samples. I used 1,000 in my final. You can see what 200, 200 looks like. Um, my frames per second was 24, which is the default. Make sure your resolution is set to 100% of whatever your, your final frames uh, need to look like. And then the denoising, which is um, a recommendation, especially when you're dealing with fire. Uh, because you can get uh, a fair amount of noise as the, the light hits the smoke particle. Once you're comfortable, all your settings are set, then uh, hit the animation button and realize you won't be using your computer for a while. Now, you can stop it, of course, as you're rendering the frames. And as it's done with the frame and uh, you're ready for it to continue again, then you're just going to change your starting frame. So if you rendered 50 frames, then you want to start at 51. And that way here, obviously not starting all over again. Now I'm pretty sure this is the only project I've ever done that I did no compositing whatsoever after the fact. The closest thing I did was come over here and make sure I'm using Filmic, which I'm using for everything, uh, and changing the, the look from base contrast to medium contrast just to change the, um, the look here a little bit. That's it. From there, rendered out all the frames, brought them into Premiere Pro, uh, added some sound effects. Of course, you can bring your video frames into Blender and do the same thing. I just happen to use Premiere Pro. Uh, added the sound effects, which I'll include the links to in the description, and got this. Guys, thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or feedback or even ideas for additional tutorials, feel free to leave them in the comments. Cheers.